This program is brought to you by Grand Valley State University. I think it was some liar who told me that the Meadows was an easy golf course. I'm not sure who that was, but thanks, uh, thanks for having me here today. Actually, uh, talk a little bit about leadership. You know, I've, I've, this is not necessarily a speech because I don't really want to uh, proselytize too much, but I am going to do a recruiting effort at the end of this because uh, we talk about leadership and what we're looking for in healthcare. Uh, obviously, we're looking for a lot of good people, and so you'll hear me sort of, uh, that's sort of a string through what I'm talking about and, and what we're trying to do. And what I want to try to do today is reference a little bit about uh, some of the qualities that I see in leadership and things that we look for in people as we hire them. And then also, uh, you know, we'll have time for questions if you have anything of things that we're trying to do or things that uh, we haven't done. You know, one of the things uh, that was mentioned in my introduction uh, that I am a Hawkeye and uh, my wife and I both uh, really try to give back to the universities we attend. So we have a scholarship that we give to graduate students who want to pursue a career in not-for-profit health care, which is something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. And so uh, even though I've been here for seven plus years now and uh, seen all the success of what's going on in this community. Um, I'm sure my roots are always back in Iowa City. I don't talk a whole lot about it now because their football team is terrible, their basketball team is pathetic, and uh, wrestling team is good though. That's the only thing I think that we can talk about. But, but uh, I've been doing this uh, healthcare gig for over actually 33 years. Wow, I didn't think I was that old. but. Um, Started right out of undergraduate school. You know, I was kind of a green kid, didn't know much. I knew I was going to go to grad school, didn't exactly know what I wanted to do at that point. I know I didn't want to continue to go to school at that time. Remember, this was back in the late 60s, early 70s. There was sort of a lot of turmoil going on in the country at that point. Uh, and I had a high draft number, so I figured I was pretty safe at that point. But uh, I was married and uh, decided to get into healthcare uh, really by accident. Uh, I always tell the story, it is a true story, that I had two job offers. One was in healthcare and one was in another industry altogether. And the only reason I picked the healthcare job is because my wife, uh, of some 33 years, is a radiology tech, or she used to be, and she had a job in a hospital, and if I worked in that hospital, we would only need one car. And so that's my tremendous vision and planning and how I got into healthcare to begin with, but it uh, really is sometimes by accident and pretty fortuitous. When, you, when I first got in there, I didn't know anything about healthcare. The only time I was in a hospital was when I was born, and I don't remember much about that, to tell you the truth. So it, I knew nothing about it. I thought it was nurses and docs, and I didn't think there was anything else. I didn't know anything about any other careers. And so I was in this huge, huge health complex in Peoria, Illinois. and. Um, I remember just walking in there and, and sort of looking around and trying to get an idea. And it took me about two or three years to try to figure out this is not a bad thing. There's a lot of opportunity here. You can do a lot in healthcare if you have, uh, I think, the right kind of educational credentials and the right kind of ambition. So it took me that long, really, to try to figure out this is what I wanted to do. But I've been at uh, Spectrum Health for seven years and worked in lots of other places. And actually, I think that's a positive. There are those who work in one place for 30 or 40 years. There's nothing wrong with that either. I always tell uh, students and others that I talk to that uh, there certainly is no one way in which you can advance your career. But getting exposure to multiple places, uh, even a stint down in Texas, which really isn't the real world, but the rest of it's in the Midwest, it really was, uh, it was really good for me. I learned a lot. I uh, think I'm a lot better at leadership and management because of that. And uh, I think that uh, anyone who talks to me, we, we have a lot of conversations with students and we certainly recruit a lot of people and hire a lot of people. We talk quite a bit about you know, how do you advance your career and what is the best path. I'm not sure there is a single way to do it, but uh, getting exposure to lots of different organizations was really helpful to me. You know, at Spectrum Health, uh, I just have to correct a couple of numbers, uh, 13,000, actually we have 14,500. I hate even saying that because it's probably higher than that right now. We have a lot of people. Healthcare is an incredibly labor-intensive uh, organization and industry. We have a lot of people who lay hands on patients, but we have a lot of people outside of uh, patient care 
that most people aren't aware of. We have a place on 44th Street called our service center, business service center, where we have over 500 people do a lot of billing and scheduling. We have an IT building that we bought from Steelcase on 60th Street, where we must have at least 300 people there who work in nothing but IT jobs. So there's a lot of opportunity all over the place. So we have uh, an awful lot of employees, and that number is going to continue to rise. Uh, Spectrum Health was created. Uh, I won't give you a big history lesson here, but I think it's important in the context of some of the examples that I'm going to use for what leadership is all about. But Spectrum Health was created by some pretty visionary people in, in the mid-90s. They brought together a couple of warring factions. You had Blodgett Hospital and Butterworth Hospital, really hotly competitive, really didn't like each other very much. They came together in the mid-90s and what was something that from afar, because I wasn't here at the time, certainly I thought was amazing that they were able to be able to pull that off. And they did an incredible job of bringing together two organizations who didn't like each other and try to create a culture of inclusiveness and trying to get things moved forward. So that's how it was all started. And uh, as mentioned, we have seven hospitals across the West Michigan. We could have a lot more of those if we wanted to, but we really want to focus on uh, the seven that we have. We have a large health plan with Priority Health that we're the owner of as well. And so we're in both sides of that business. But you weren't here to give, uh, let me talk about uh, the advertisement for Spectrum Health. You're here to talk about leadership. And I really have eight items I want to talk about. The, the number could be 100, but uh, actually after eight, I kind of run out of juice. So that's as many as you're going to hear. But, uh, and I think, uh, I don't know if we're going to have those yet. And I'm going to talk about each one just for a few minutes, but I think it's important to, in order to talk about leadership qualities, you've got to have some sense of creating a vision. Essentially, where are you going to go? We call it a roadmap many times, but it's you have some idea of where you're going to go, and I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. And I think the second one is something that I really think is critically important, and that's uh, having some sense of business ethics. And I'll give you some examples from early in my career in which uh, I'm glad I turned out the way I did, but you know, you have tremendous opportunities to take different paths if you're not careful. And I think uh, the third one talks about daring and courage, and you have to be afraid, not afraid to take risk, not afraid to fail, and you've got to have some people who are willing to follow you. If you don't have that, you're not much of a leader. And I think the other is talking about culture of excellence. That'll tie in quite a bit with our vision statement. Number six I'll talk about has to do with, I think you have to look outside long term, but you've got to keep things operating today. And we have a lot of people, and I'll talk about how we try to do that at Spectrum Health, try to have a sense of vision, but also have a sense of making sure the trains run on time, which is important. And then we have the stakeholder symmetry, and there's nothing like healthcare stakeholder symmetry. I mean, we have so many people that, as I try to say multiple times, I have no shortage of people telling me what to do. And I have another statement I'll mention. Uh, there's no shortage of people taking credit when something goes well either. But we have a lot of individuals who uh, are telling me my job all the time. And last but not least, it's really talking about uh, being able to create strategic alliances and trying to work with others in partnerships. I'll take the first one about compelling vision. I think really what we try to say is that all leaders have the capacity to create a compelling vision. And that's really essentially taking the organization to a new place. And I think the key here is you've got to be able to translate this vision into reality. And really the way we do that at Spectrum Health is through strategic planning. And that's the, that's the actual operation we do to take this vision and bring it back to earth. And I'll talk about the specifics of that in just a second. I'm a firm believer in that the good things that happen in your organization usually happen because you plan for them. Now that doesn't mean there aren't things that happen. Just a couple of days ago, I heard some very good news that there was an old suit settled in, actually it happened in 1990, 91, and 92. We were part of a group trying to get some money out of the federal government that, that we felt they owed us, and we finally got paid. It was about five million bucks, but that was from 90, 91 and 92, so vigilance does help, but sometimes manna falls from heaven, and that's pretty good, but uh, not often. And I think the reverse of that is true. I think the bad things that happen within organizations happen many times because people don't plan for them. You're not prepared for those things that are going to be occurring. You're not flexible enough to deal with the changes that come along. 
I think the other thing that's important for leadership is they're going to have to have the strength to be vigilant and persist, even though you're going to hit roadblocks, you're going to hit people who say you are a failure, you're going to have things that set you back, but I think your vigilance to move forward certainly exhibits leadership qualities. And I think the most important part here is how do you communicate your vision to people? We have 14,500 people. I'd like to say I know them all. I do not. I guarantee you I don't know them all. But one of my responsibilities is to set up with our board where we want to go as an organization. So how do you communicate that? Not only communicate it to 14,500 people, but do it in a way you can understand it. We're talking about people with severely advanced degrees, PhDs, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to people who can't read or write. And so how do you communicate with that kind of diversity in a way they have an understanding of where you're trying to go? At Spectrum Health, I think you have to remember a little bit about, um, and maybe you don't, but in 2000 when I came, the organization was three years into this merger. And really what they tried to do in those three years was just get the place to work. You know, we had to make sure patients were taken care of, bills were sent out, that we had enough people around. Uh, and there was an awful lot of work being done, and really good work, I think, in those three years to just make this new entity called Spectrum Health work. And that's what I think the first three years were about. When I came in 2000, it was pretty obvious that there was, let's say, a lack of direction. What we had is we had many directions. And when I would ask 15 people what's our top priority, I'd get 15 different answers. And so we were going all over the place. We had a group of doctors who wanted to build an OB center. We wanted a heart center. We wanted a children's hospital. We wanted this. And then we had a health plan who wanted all sorts of things. So essentially what it was really almost a blind man could see it, was that essentially what you had was you had an organization that didn't have a sense of vision. And it gets filled up. That void gets filled up by somebody. And what you have is a lot of power politics. You have a lot of people then trying to thrust whatever, whoever they could get as their significant supporters to move their agenda forward, whether it's the best thing or not. And that was sort of the environment that I uh, inherited. And so really it was very easy, I think, early on to try to at least get a sense of direction, try to develop that sense of direction. And one of the things that leaders have to do is they have to make decisions. And you have to make decisions and uh, not always be popular. And so when we created our vision in 2003, and essentially what it says is to be the nation's highest quality and most successful healthcare enterprise by 2010, I tell you, we got a lot of pushback on that one. We got a lot of pushback. People go, what do you mean we want to be the best? How do you know you are the best? How do you define it? I can remember media people asking me, what are you going to be, Mayo Clinic then? I mean, they didn't get it. They didn't get what we were talking about. What we were talking about is creating this culture within our organization that everything we do, we benchmark against the very best. That's how you become an organization that is the best. We used the whole issue of 2010. Had a lot of people that were talking about, oh my God, in September of 2010, are you going to stand up and proclaim you are the best somehow? I said, no, that you're missing the point. Everybody is busy. We have everybody's job has 20 things that need to be done right now. If you don't put a sense of urgency in there, which is really what this date-specific timeline was, you'll find that it gets pushed back and gets pushed back and gets pushed back. So essentially what we said is we want people to feel a sense of urgency. We feel by 2010 we want to have many things in place that moves us towards that goal of being the best. And that was the whole idea. We spent a lot of time on our planning document. I'm not a big one for having a big, thick strategic plan. In fact, I brought our strategic plan today. This is it. And actually, the only reason it's on a card this big is because my eyes aren't as good, and so I need a bigger card. It wasn't a smaller card. Essentially, what we try to do in strategic planning is lay out what kind of strategic initiatives or directions do we want the organization to take. And from that, the various components of our organization then develop the various tactics to get that done. But people can remember this. They don't remember a book this thick. It's a good doorstop, and I've seen those used. I actually used them myself as doorstops. They don't mean anything. They're not usable. You can't communicate anything to anybody if you have a document that thick. And so we stress often to have something that's simple and concise people can, can ascertain. The second one I want to talk about has to do with integrity. And uh, here the whole idea is that leaders got to be trustworthy. You got to be able to trust people. And you have to be 
trustworthy. You know, your motives have got to be, I think, transparent. You've got to have honesty. I think leaders are asking people to follow them and accept risk. And if they don't feel comfortable that they can do that in a way that they're not somehow going to have, <clears throat> they don't have the confidence or you know, the knowledge, skill, or ethical behavior to follow you, it's going to be problematic. You know, at Spectrum Health, we have a group of values, which are characteristics that we expect everybody to have. It's on that card that I just showed you. Those values, which consist of compassion, excellence, innovation, integrity, respect, teamwork, those are all good things. In fact, if you went to any healthcare organization, you would probably find similar words. But you need more than that. You know, you got to walk the walk, not just talk it. And the fact of the matter is, we have a lot of managerial people, a lot of leaders. I'd love to say every single one of them get it. I think the vast majority of them do, but not everybody does. So those are the ones that we have to continually work on. We have formalized structures to ensure ethical behavior. Having six or seven words and saying we want everybody to act like this is not enough. You'd like to think it is, but it is not. You have to have something more formalized. We have things like internal audit that evaluates things and goes in and evaluates controls and see how we process money. We have risk and compliance organizations. We have lots of people who are risk managers. These are people who look at and evaluate the risk that we have in doing things. They look at compliance. How, how well do we comply with the law that we understand? And we have mechanisms by which people can communicate if they feel there is a problem. They can do it anonymously or they can do it through whatever process that we have in place. We also have the code of conduct, which is the expectation of how we're going to treat other employees, visitors, patients, families, doctors. And we expect people to act that way. And last but certainly not least, we have staff education. We have to make sure that we continually educate people on what these issues are. So we spend a lot of time in this whole area of, of ethical behavior. It's critically important for us. I can remember my first job in healthcare. I was, like I said, I was just a green kid, didn't know anything about hospitals. And this is a true example. One of the jobs I had, and I thought I was hot stuff, I used to buy equipment for nursing units. So I would buy beds, and we'd buy probably 75 beds a year. So I did what any of you would probably do, and that is you'd ask the people who actually use them and ask, People have to clean them and fix them. What kind of beds do we want? Well, we always came up with the same model. This is the Cadillac of beds, and the cost was not unreasonable. So this is, we wanted bed from beds from company A. And so I would fill out all the appropriate forms. I'd send it down to purchasing, and the beds would all come back from company B. And I thought, what the hell does this mean? I don't get it. I filled them out right. I asked all the right people. I went down and... And we had this guy, kind of looked uh, like a combination of the Wizard of Oz and only weighed about 350 pounds. He was the head of purchasing. It's the big old guy. Not a bad guy, but just a, you know, he had his little fiefdom down there and he was the head of purchasing. <coughs> and he told me the reason that we always get beds from B instead of A is because he got a cut. He was very open about it. He said, I get money when we buy from and I thought, and I was, you know, you got to remember I was like 21 or 22 years old. And this was my first exposure to this kind of stuff. And I thought, my God, I hope this isn't the way business is usually run. And, uh, and, but he was very blatant about it. He said his whole goal is to buy a Cadillac. This is how he's going to do it. So one of the things that you have as a student is that you'll be in these ethical dilemmas and you've got to ask the question, what do you do? Frankly, that's such an obvious example of something that did happen, but there's a lot more subtle examples of things that go all the time. And we spend a lot of time making sure within our organization that people are aware of that. And we have policies actually that talk about what sort of gifts can we accept from people. And I used to have a person that I really respected. He was a vice president, you know, and again, I was just out of graduate school and, and um, Again, I thought I knew everything, but obviously didn't. But this guy was really a highly qualified, been in the business for 20-some years. And every year he used to go to Utah to go skiing with this company who sold heart catheters. And he just thought it was a great trip. And he said, oh, this is a great trip. We'll go out for a week. And they pay for everything, and it's really wonderful. And I just thought, you know, it just doesn't smell right. Well, just being the kind of inquisitive person I was, I sort of checked and found out that, yes, 
every heart catheter we bought was from that company. What a surprise. And so this guy just didn't get it. But you will find examples like that all the time. So how you deal with ethical dilemmas is really going to be, I think, a, a significant point of what kind of a leader you're going to be. Talk about uh, exhibiting dairy and courage. You know, we sometimes in healthcare have to take some unexplored paths or things that that uh, we have to create that hasn't been created. I mean, we do that all the time. We'd like to be able to, to do the old tried and true things, but you know, the whole dynamic is changing so much and the industry is changing so much. There's so much out there that uh, is untested. So what do we have to do to, to get this way? And I think real leaders are not afraid of this unexplored path. I think you talk about inspiration, of trying to get others to take risk and suspend their disbelief and really aren't discouraged by uh, adversity. You know, I always tell people that it doesn't take anything to manage when everything is going well. You know, everything is going well. The skill set it takes to just kind of keep things humming along is not nearly as significant as it is when things aren't going as well. I think real leaders try to keep big pictures in mind and real leaders try to figure out where they want to go. Now when we talk about Spectrum Health and this whole daring and courage, sometimes we try things that don't work. You know, I've tried things several times. Good ideas, I thought they were anyway. Tested them out, found out they didn't work at all. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think if you don't ever fail at anything, you're not taking enough risk. Now I always like to equate it to baseball. You know, my batting average is a lot better than 300, which is a pretty good average in baseball. And I think in the business world, you have to be a little bit higher, I'd say, than 300. But the fact matter is, you are going to try things that don't work. And I think we have tried uh, several things. And a lot of times, it is because of timing. The timing of those things just uh, isn't proper. Sometimes you lay the foundation for something two or three years down the road, but you have a great idea, and no one else is at the same level or point in time that you are. And so you can either bring everybody else there or just go ahead and do it. And I think what we try to do is a combination of both of those. And we have a lot of very young, very, very good management people, very good, strong leaders. And, uh, you know, there's, I have an example of somebody who's really a, a star in the making who her first board presentation was like an auctioneer. I never saw anybody talk so fast. And, you know, it's all good stuff. All the material was really top notch, but I said afterwards, you know, it might be helpful, A, if you took a breath, sort of, sometime, and B, just pause so people could at least, you know, ask questions or at least sort of gather and soak in the information. Well, you only had to say it once. Next time, the next presentation was done exquisitely well. So the whole idea about just making sure that you have some of these people learning from their errors and being able to adjust is an another good uh, good point about leadership. I want to talk about uh, getting others to follow you. I, I think the real key is there without followers you don't have any leaders. And it's a good friend of mine who writes books. Uh, he wrote a book on followership. And I, I said it's just a quick way to try to sell a book, I think. But, but really in there he was quoting some of the things that we're doing at Spectrum Health. It's the whole idea of just getting people brought along at the same pace that you are, trying to inspire others to embrace whatever it is you're trying to do. Uh, I think one of the things is that uh, he talked about, and I certainly agree with, is you know people work to the expectation you have of them. If you expect good things, they'll work up to that level. If you expect mediocrity, that's usually where they'll end up. And I think uh, when we talk about this at, in an industry like uh, healthcare, where Spectrum Health resides, is that think of all the change that's going on. You know, I tell people when they talk about getting care today, I said, I wouldn't want to be cared for with 1975 medicine. I wouldn't even want to be cared for with 1995 medicine. Things have advanced so much so quickly. If you think about advances in the science and how people are looking and identifying disease and treating it, look at the technology, things that are being built, things that they'll be able to see inside of you and outside of you that uh, are non-invasive. There's all sorts of things. As you, for those of you who are young enough, you'll, you'll get to appreciate that when you reach the age of 50 and they talk about virtual colonoscopies. You'll find that uh, those things, uh, you'll like that yeah, a lot. <laughs> Trust me. 
But this whole therapy and things the way the way people are being treated, it's this whole dynamic is changing so much. I get asked a lot by uh, people when we go through some of our agendas. They they all ask me, "How do you sleep at night?" And I, I give them the usual quip about, "Well, drugs are wonderful, but that's that's not how it's done." Actually, you sleep a lot because you have other good leaders within the organization. You have a myriad of people who are who feel responsible for whatever it is they are responsible for. You know, this delegation upward is not something that we adhere to. You need to have a huge cadre of leadership in an organization as complex as healthcare in order to make it work. And we were just joking earlier, we don't close. We're open 24-7. You know, over the Christmas holiday, at any one time, we probably had 600 inpatients in our hospital beds. None of them wanted to be there, as you might imagine. Nobody wants to be there over the holidays. And so we're never closed. And so that presents other issues with that. If you look at um, <clears throat> what's happened to Spectrum Health over just the last 10 years since its inception, is that it was a $700 million organization back in 97. Today it's $2.5 billion. And we think as we're doing our planning and projection in the next five years, that number will be closer to uh, $4.6 billion. In the next five years, we're looking to add around 3,000 people to the payroll. So when you ask me back in three years, I'll be able to talk about our 17,500 folks. But the fact of the matter is, what we're looking for in our organization, we want not only people who inspire others, but we want people who are builders, because that's what we're going to need. Talk in terms of uh, over, uh, creating a culture of excellence, I think the issue here is what does that mean? When we're doing our vision, this whole idea is, is to create this culture. When we're talking about people, we're not only trying to inspire them to be the best, but we do a lot of benchmarking against the very best in the country. And in many instances, we set the bar. It's not what we're trying to aspire to, we set that bar. In terms of our industry, I mean, we're talking a lot about creating exceptional experiences. I know one of you was, was working in that whole arena there, trying to make every exposure that people have to Spectrum Health, whether it's in the hospitals or within the health plan, <clears throat> something that is a positive. We want people to be part of a winning team. And I can't tell you how many people within this community, people that many of you would know, very public officials and people who have come to us and asked, how do I, I want to be employed by Spectrum Health. How can I hook on to you? And a lot of that has to do with, I think we're uh, an organization on the rise. Nobody in their careers gets excited about going, my God, I just got a job with a mediocre company. Nobody gets excited about that. You get excited about success. And when we're talking about this culture of excellence, who was mentioned in my uh, introduction, about 50 quality and safety awards, they're all nice. I mean, that, that makes people feel good because you get recognized for the things that you're doing. But if you look at the real numbers, the things that matter, when you get care there, is your chance of getting better, better there than it is somewhere else. That's really what it comes. You don't want to walk in there and come out worse than you were when you came in. And by any metric you would use, and again, healthcare is not an exact science, as many people would think, but you're going to be better off. And if you look at the metrics that we use to measure that against anybody in the country, they look pretty impressive. And part of that is this huge data collection, transparency, making sure that you have information. That whole push there is part of what we're trying to do in this whole area of, of making people understand this culture of excellence. And it gets people excited. People are excited about working in a place in which you set the bar high. Not everybody can lead in that type of organization. We have had many people leave, frankly, because they, they kind of like the old ways. I like living in my little bubble, and they feel very uncomfortable when being pushed to try to be better. And that's OK. They, I mean, there's certainly nothing wrong with them, but that's not the type of person that we're looking to recruit. The uh, sixth one I have is talking about long view, but understanding the importance of now. I think the important thing about that is that leaders have to be patient. I mean, vision requires change, and change uh, takes time. And uh, as much as I'd like to say that we can turn Spectrum Health in a dime, that's just not possible. You know, we struggle. We have 
1,400 physicians that we have to communicate with. When we have a structural change of some kind, just getting information to them, because not all of them use email. Some have fax, but I mean, believe it or not, there's probably some still using an abacus. But it's trying to communicate to a wide variety of people is not always easy. So change can be difficult. But I think the real key is you've got to understand the decisions have to be made on a daily basis. I always like to say you've got to keep the trains running on time. That's important. And the vision statement that you have and you know, the, the struggles you have and the planning you do mean nothing if you don't provide the service that you have out there. And the real challenge you have then is how do you balance them both? How do you balance the here and now with the future vision? That's the real key of a leader. If you can do that, you're going to be successful. And trust me, that's not always easy. And I think sometimes with experience that can work out. One of the things that we have at uh, Spectrum Health that we're working on is you know, this whole decade of 2000, if you go up on Michigan Street Hill, you see lots of holes and cranes and buildings. That's something you might never see again for 30 years. It was really laying the infrastructure for the baby boomers who were going to really flood health care in the next probably 15 years. And so building the infrastructure necessary <clears throat> is what we tried to do. We spent a lot of time on not only building buildings, but technology, hiring talent, diversification, building our reputation, and expanding our geography. That's what we're trying to do in this decade we're in. And magically, in the next decade, it's not just going to flip a switch, but you're not going to see us building big buildings. Uh, in the next decade. What you're going to see is much more focus on relationship building, expanding our geography, because really healthcare needs size and scale. It's very important. It's very important for our cost structure to be able to have the economies of scale to deal with that. And they're doing that in lots of other places. If you look around other states, you will see a lot of combinations of hospitals. Happens quite a bit. Although here in Grand Rapids, we did have the combination of, of Blodgett and Butterworth. That was significant, but really there's an awful lot of rural hospitals that are standalone institutions, and they're in a lot of trouble. Uh, some of them do very well today, but most of them are going to have difficulty in the next five to ten years. And so when we're looking to enlarge our geography, what does that mean for us? <clears throat> we're spending a lot of time over this next decade trying to figure out exactly what we need to do. The uh, Next leadership issue has to do with stakeholder symmetry and probably spend all day talking about this, but I promise you I won't. But uh, you know, we don't have shareholders within a not-for-profit arena. We have stakeholders. We don't have our owners don't have a piece of the pie like if you're a uh, shareholder in a, in a for-profit company. But we have to be accountable for our actions and every decision that we make is influenced by this group of shareholders and that is a long, long list. And the real key for leadership is balancing the interest of the shareholders or the stakeholders, whichever you want to call them, while advancing your organizational vision. If you look at uh, healthcare, it's in particular Spectrum Health, people that we have that are stakeholders include the culture of the community we're in, the public, the board of directors that I report to. We have physicians, donors who give us money, staff, probably not unlike universities in many ways. A wide variety of people. We have our own employees, we have other local healthcare providers, the government, insurance, media, public, and the list goes on and on and on. We have a tremendous number of people, like I said, uh, willing to tell me what to do. That's not a shortage. And I think probably one of the most important things, if I say anything that you remember today, is that leadership, you have to be comfortable with making decisions without 100% of the information and without 100% consensus. Because frankly, if you need to have those, you're going to struggle. Because if I had to have 100% consensus or 100% of the information available before I made a decision, I would never make a decision. And it comes down to what's your comfort level in making a decision with partial data, and also making sure that if you have 20 people, you may only have seven or eight who agree with you, and the rest of them have their own agendas. And in particular in healthcare, I think that's probably more evident than a lot of places. The last leadership quality I want to mention talks about the 
alliance and partnership issue, I think in some industries, obviously, they think on a global basis because their constituency is the entire globe. Healthcare, even though in some fringe areas is moving that way, most of it is a very local industry. It is not a global industry. But the idea is that you cannot go it alone. You do need to be able to cooperate and work with others. We do that in many, many different ways. The real question I had a real struggle with when I was uh, just kind of growing up within the industry was how can you compete and cooperate with the same organization? And I never thought that was possible. I thought it doesn't make any sense. You know, you're either friend or foe. Can't be both. And in reality, as I learned as I got a little older and a little more experienced, that indeed you can do both. And in healthcare in particular, you do both all the time. It's very common. And so we ask ourselves a question about what exactly is partnerships, and what do they mean, and what's the difference between those and alliances and what they mean. But I think uh, we do a lot of work with our regional partners. We do a lot of work. Uh, we set up formalized mechanisms to work with community hospitals across West Michigan. We do that in the area of children's care. We do that in uh, just hospitals in general. We have lots of things like that. So really the whole idea is that we're going to have to continue to do that, and I think leadership, the successful leaders are those who can work with others. And sometimes uh, we don't always get accused of working with others well, but I think if you look at the track record, I think it speaks for itself. So let me just end by saying that healthcare is a tremendously complex industry. It's going to get more complex as we go. The need for good to great managers, leaders, <coughs> who are flexible is going to be critical. I like to equate it to athletes. That I like to hire good athletes, people that can do lots of things. Because frankly, when I was talking to a group of managers a few months ago, saying in, in probably five to seven years, half of their jobs will have changed into different titles. We have within the healthcare industry over, I, I'm sure, at least 250 different titles that go on. I had lunch with a group of, I, I do this periodically with employees, it's a very good thing for me to sort of get unfiltered comments from people. And I was out at our uh, IT department on 60th Street talking to a group of people, there's about 22 or 3 people. I usually ask them their name because I don't know them all, of course, but, and what do they do? And of the 20 people, not two of them had the same title. And, you know, they're either analysts of this or, I mean, I couldn't even remember what they all were. But the fact of the matter is there's tremendous opportunity in healthcare. It isn't all just hands-on patients, clinical work. The amount of information, and this really is going to be a paperless industry going forward, the amount of information and the needs for that is going to be critical. There is an age-old question that comes up, uh, you know, are leaders born or are they educated to be leaders? Since I'm in an educational institution, I ought to say they probably are educated. But, but I think it's a mixture of both. You know, I've seen people who have, uh, you know, been not particularly strong leaders, but been educated such that has experience that have done very, very well. And I've seen the opposite of that true. Uh, but there is one thing that I think is incredibly critical, critical for good leadership, and that is the ability and the being comfortable in making decisions. When I hire somebody, that's what I look for. Would they be comfortable making decisions? Because frankly, that's what leaders do. And you won't have the consensus of everybody. So let me end there. Hope I didn't talk too long. But uh, be happy to answer any questions about any of this stuff or anything else that anyone would like to ask. But thank you again for allowing me to interfere with your lunch. Yes, sir. chapter in this book, Good to Great, about level five leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, he mentions a lot of different qualities, including uh, great competence and humility. Uh, but he focuses also in particular on uh, a leader's willingness to admit when he doesn't know all the answers and his ability to inspire others to lead. Uh, how important is that to, to leadership in healthcare and other industries? No, I think uh, I think it's that's what allows me to sleep at night. I think it's critical. Uh, you know, I think probably one of the best attributes of any leader is hiring good people. And uh, you can.
can tell a lot about organizations by who they hire. And uh, I always believed in hiring the best. And I know I have many, many people a lot smarter than I am. And I like a mixture of people around. I like people who aren't all from the same ilk. You know, I was very traditional. I went to graduate school. I worked in an entry-level management position. Then I was a VP. And I sort of worked up that ladder. We have a lot of other people who have very diverse backgrounds, some that are not healthcare related. You know, our HR person came from industry, Dow Chemical, never worked in a hospital in his life. And so I think what you need, what I feel good about, I'll just give you a personal exposure, is that I think having that kind of diversity around the table makes for better decision making. You come at things differently, and uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. But uh, yeah, I think the idea of hiring the best you can get but you know, I hate to say it, but not all my colleagues feel that way. A lot of times you feel threatened by having somebody who may be smarter than you and uh, who may be more ambitious. And I see that in some of my peers. It's not uncommon. I'd stay away from those organizations. They'd be very limited about your growth, especially if you have ambition and talent. Anything else? Yes, sir. Spectrum Health is doing a tremendous job. Many people come there for different reasons, and we really appreciate what you're doing. But we also get feedback from people from there and even from other hospitals that have been, like the size of the Spectrum Hospitals. I have a sister actually who is a nurse somewhere else, but one of the biggest concerns that the nurses have right now is that if you are in some of these big hospitals, you do not put a lot of your time and effort on the patients or in the patients. You spend a lot of the time on the computers, either putting in data or collecting data, things like that. And they're becoming frustrated, they're saying it's better to work in the small hospitals because there you care for the people, you attend to them, you help them. But in the big hospitals, you just spend a lot of the time on the computers. Now, what is the management doing so that the frustration is not there, the patients are happy? Well, first of all, I'd like to dispel the myth that you could only get that kind of care in small hospitals, because I don't think that's true. Um, in fact, I know it's not true. I think uh, it doesn't matter the size of the facility on how you treat patients or the systems you have in place. But I will say this, there have been lots of studies done that show the probably the best size, if you will, for a hospital is anything about 300 beds. You get much larger than that, then it becomes a lot very complex. If you look at the Butterworth campus, that'll have 900 beds there big place. And with complexity, it isn't so much that I have more paperwork to do. We're trying to make that as paperless as possible. And sometimes with large organizations, you have the ability to do things that small organizations do not because you have more resources. But there is always a fear of, of the larger places. There's two things that I'm most concerned about in that. One is uh, corporate arrogance and corporate complacency. The arrogance is that, you know, we're a big place, we know better. And you have to be very careful of that because that creeps in because you attract really hard-charging, high-level folks, and sometimes that filters in the organization. You have to be careful. The other one about corporate complacency is I'm a you know, small wheel. You know, what I do doesn't really matter because the place is so large. I think we spend a lot of effort making sure that's not what we do. But I mean, that is, that is an issue that you have to deal with. But I, certainly that is a myth that you can only get that kind of hands-on care in small places. But first hospital I ever ran was 270 beds. I knew almost every employee's name. Uh, had some of the best staff I've ever worked with. Just great people. Just great people. And uh, you know, that was, a, that was a great organization. It was a great size of organization to get to know people. But we had very limited resources in which to do things. We would not be doing many of the things that we're currently doing within Spectrum Health simply because we didn't have the resource, either the people or the money to be able to do them. So. It's a real balancing act there, but you can and should be able to provide very personalized care no matter what the size of the place is. But it is something we're very cognizant of. That's a very good point. No, you can't ask anybody. No, go ahead. Yes, sir. As you know, all industries, uh, your industry, my industry, uh, have to respond to change. If I looked at your uh, eight here as a leader, what would stand out to be the most important uh, characteristic or qualities 
to ensure uh, that the change is uh, going to uh, be most uh, effective and efficient. I think if you look at these eight, it kind of depends on where you're at in the organization. For me personally, you know, my role is obviously the first one. It's the one that probably matters. But I think the one that we try to stress throughout our organization, we have, God, I don't even know, probably have 800 people that are in the manager, director, VP level people, at least 800. could be more than that. I think the one that we really spend a lot of time focusing on is, is this one about understanding First of all, having a grasp of what's going on on a larger basis, but at the same time understanding where what it is you do fits in to that vision. And that's not always easy with uh, some people. It's easier for others. Uh, but that's the one we spend a great deal of time. We spend a lot of time in all of these, frankly. But that's the one I think I always look to, making sure that, you know, taking the long view of things, understanding that, but making sure things do work is critical for us. But for me personally, I spend probably most, if not all, my time right there. And it's creating a vision for the place to try to figure out where we're going. And, and that changes. You know, we do planning on a three-year horizon. We do financial planning on a five-year horizon. And healthcare doing anything much beyond 18 months is tough. And we're uh, subject to the same sort of things that impact universities. Uh, I don't think there's any other industry that's as regulated as healthcare. I mean, we get bombarded with new regulations, and we have presidential candidates that are running for office that we're not quite sure. We know some of the rhetoric that's being spewed out there, but we're not really sure what it is that whoever is the next president is going to be looking at doing for health care. And, uh, you know, that'll be a challenge. But if you have the right kind of athletes in place, it doesn't matter. We'll be able to deal with whatever it is. And that's what we're trying to do. Yes, sir. Um, there seems to be a lot of competition inside of the healthcare industry, especially dealing with you know where you want to take your body to, to essentially have work done. And when you consider a place like Spectrum Health that's decided to stay in Grand Rapids, build in Grand Rapids, and have a significant amount of infrastructure, and then you see things kind of on the fringe like uh, Metro Health, Auto 86, that sort of thing, how do you decide? where to invest, because in my studies in public administration, we, we deal with building fantastic cities. So what, what, what makes Spectrum Health stay here? Obviously, there are some obvious things, but uh, what about a city compels someone to stay within those boundaries and grow there? I think if you, you have to go back, uh, and again, I'm not sure I have the right answer for here, but I think if you go back to the mid-90s when the people in this community who had vision said, we want something more out of healthcare in this community. It wasn't that the healthcare community was bad, it wasn't. But it was sort of at this level. So how do you make it rise up to here? And some of those people felt one of the ways you do it is that you need size in order to attract things like a medical school, for instance. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of people, again, standing in line saying, gee, we, we helped that. And a lot of people were very instrumental, but frankly, the medical school would never have been here if it wasn't for Spectrum Health. They wouldn't have, because there wouldn't have been a reason for them to come to town. But the fact of the matter is, those people back in the mid-90s, when they were deciding and trying to entice these two organizations to come together, and then fought the federal government, the Trade Commission, FTC, to get it approved, I really believed, if you ask them, because there are people, you know, names that have been around and they're still quite active, that their idea was to build something better and more significant. It doesn't mean, again, this is the thing that we talk a lot about, uh, and this really aggravates me because I hear staff every once in a while and I always chastise them because I don't believe in the fact that the only way you can be better if somebody is worse. There's nothing wrong with having other organizations in the community be good as well. And I think healthcare in this community is pretty well served. But for us, one of the things that we look at is in order for us to build this big structure on the Michigan Street Hill, we felt we needed that kind of economies and that kind of size there. But if you look what we're doing on the Blodgett campus over in East Grand Rapids, is we're making that look a lot more like Metro and St. Mary's. It's about that size. Because we think there's, a, there's a, a market for that. We have a lot of people that we need to serve that are looking for that kind of market. So that's how you do that. And I think the other thing when you're looking at, uh, this city isn't really that large, but there's always an age old issue about building in the city versus the suburbs. 
And in most large communities, you find, uh, depends, you know, go over to Detroit. You want to see a tremendous, go look at Henry Ford is doing and all of those inner city hospitals, huge, very, very well-run organizations. What are they doing? They're all building facilities out in, out in the suburbs. And the reason they're doing that is because you just look at the population shift and what's going on. And not only that, there is a market, that's where people are moving to. In many instances, healthcare usually tries to go where the population is going. We don't always have it right. You know, our planning isn't always 100%, but I think that's what you see. When you see large population growth, you usually see an infusion of some kind of healthcare. If you look at M6, yeah, you have Metro building their hospital out there, but you also have St. Mary's building an ambulatory site right across the street. Spectrum Health has something on the west side, and we also have something east of there. So I think we're all trying to serve what could be a growing population area. But there's a lot of planning that goes on in that. And I tell you, it's very expensive to build and move hospitals. And it's a big crapshoot. There's no guarantee that when you do it, you're going to be successful in the long run. There's always an initial blip of excitement and support. But pretty soon it always drops like this. And it's tough. This day and age is very difficult. I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, ma'am. I was going to follow up on your comment about the vision, and I was wondering how you're communicating that because you were commenting how you have such a wide range of people that you communicate to. Well, you do it in lots of different ways. You've got to have lots of people who are carrying the message. I mean, you know, I do it. I have, you know, Granholm has a state of the state, and Bush has a state of the I do a state of the system address in February. Nancy uh, is very good at penning the right kind of things. But, you know, we talk about our vision there quite a bit. But that, you know, that gets a few hundred people, maybe a few thousand, because, you know, we have it uh, simulcast in other places. But that, again, is just a few. And remember, we have people working 24 hours at a time. You do it in multiple ways, but it's, you have to be vigilant at it. And you have to reference things that you're doing to the vision. You know, why are we building a building? Well, we're not just building a building because we're trying to keep all the people in the trades employed. We're really doing it because it's part of a larger vision. Why are we interested in a medical school here? Well, because there's part of a vision that we're trying to do. I mean, you have to keep tying things back to that. You know, why are we trying to spend so much time on having an exceptional experience for families and patients that come into our facilities? Well, because that goes back to the culture of excellence. That goes back to creating this vision. So keep trying to tie it in and you're never done. There is no one way to proclaim it and say everybody's got it. I mean, I have trouble just getting information out to our board and there's 13 of them. So, but I mean, it's, it's hard it's, and you gotta just keep at it. We need good people, folks. There's, you know, if you look at our uh, executive staff, the average age is probably 48 to 62. I don't see any 30s in there, and I don't see very many 20s. That's not a good thing. And that's an area of focus for us. But it's important for us to have a continuation of success. You've got to have that succession planning in place. So we're spending a lot of time focusing on that effort. And it's hard because actually what happens is we have a lot of really good people. We train them very well and then someone will come in and take them and hire them somewhere else. You know, that just happens. I mean, there's nothing you can do about that. But that's something that uh, we're continually working on. Health insurance is a very critical thing in this country. And many people are making very critical decisions based on the availability of health insurance. A study was conducted by some a school in Denver, Colorado, and it showed that the University of Michigan, here in Ann Arbor, is providing one of the most comprehensive health insurance coverage for their students and faculty and staff members at one of the most inexpensive rates in the country. And because of that, they are recruiting some of the best faculty members and staff members and students because people want health insurance. Now, is there a possibility of Spectrum Health and Grand Valley State University partnering so that you may provide us with that kind of coverage so that you may help us and also recruit some of the best people in the country? 
You have to ask that guy. But we have, uh, yeah, we have insurance company Priority Health that insures lots of schools. But yeah, absolutely. I think those kind of, that goes back to this thing about partnerships. I mean, we're enjoying partnerships with GVSU in the area of nursing, nursing education. Yeah, I think the more we do in that area, it's a tremendous resource. Both organizations are tremendous resources. It's a very sound idea. As long as we have a health insurance system that we have in this country, and I don't care who gets elected, you're going to continue to see it. It may be tweaked, but it'll still be there. Uh, we have a lot of people and a lot of things kind of fall through the cracks. And I think whatever it is that gets designed to try to fill in those cracks is going to be a real challenge. But yes, I would say absolutely. In fact, I could have our insurance people call uh, Tom anytime. <laughs> no, I won't do that, but it is a good point. And I think, uh, you know, what they have, actually University of Michigan had their own health plan until just recently, and they sold it to Blue Cross. So I'm um, not sure exactly what kind of plan they have. Well done. Thank you all again. The preceding program is copyrighted by Grand Valley State University. Visit us at gbsu.edu.